Okay. Good evening then. Uh, welcome to our digital history seminar series uh, and welcome to this talk and where it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Marta Musso, um, who's a research fellow at King's College London and who is also the research coordinator for the Archives Portal Europe project. So in her talk today, Dr. Musso will talk about the complexities of integrating metadata um, through, uh, about this project and she will talk about a sp specific focus on the Archives Portal Europe. Um, she will talk for about 40 minutes or so and there will be time for questions afterwards. So please uh, put in any questions that might arise during the talk into the YouTube chat um, and we will follow up later on and we'll try to get to all of the questions. Uh, so right now it's, I'm going to hand over to Marta um, and we'll have a discussion about this later. Over to you. Thank you, Tessa, and thanks everyone for inviting me to give a talk at this uh, uh, exciting seminar series or better webinar series. Um, so yes, I would like, I'm very happy to, to be here to talk about Archives Portal Europe, which is a project I've been involved now for around five years, but it's more than 10 years old now. And I would say it's really one of the most ambitious projects of developing archives in the digital area. Um, not just from a technical point of view, but also from a more um, research-oriented point of view. Try, we're trying to find new ways of, of using digital archives for um, creating new methodologies for, for historical research. So I'm very happy to um, give a little bit of context and talk about all these things. And I hope we can then make a, a certainly more um, uh, shared discussion. Um, so as a historian, of course, I like to start with the history uh, of everything. So um, I will say that, uh, yeah, a, a little bit of context and a history for, for Archives Portal Europe is quite um, necessary. And I would like to start with 2002 when there were was, like guidelines for digitization coming out from the um, International Council of Archives and the International Federation of Library, Library and Archives, who created for UNESCO. Um, set of guidelines, a set of ideas for for archives to take note in in the digital area. And we can think, you know, 2002 was yesterday, but it was a very different time for the way in which um, people experience the digital world. The, the World Wide Web was still um, very, very new, for example, even though it's really like the, the best, probably uh, probably the best technology in which uh, in which archives can think of themselves um, for, for the future. But I remember, for example, in my house, the internet arrived in 2002 and it was a 56K connection, super slow. So it was still not, a it was very much a time of, of experimenting. Um, but they really got it right in the report where we say that, you know, libraries and archives are for and have always been the primary information provider. They are the holder of all the knowledge of the humanity ever created and, and this knowledge um, and this information keeps accumulating. Um, but they were also early adopters um, of digital technology because, of course, information technology um, changed in particular precisely for, um, for archives and for libraries. It's, this is really where the digital revolution was probably felt, um, felt the most. So why digitize, they ask in this report, and they say it should, have be, it should be for preserve for digital surrogates, um, uh, increase access, develop collabor collaborative resources, and develop technical infrastructure. But it was still, as I said, very much in its, in, in its infancy, and it's interesting to think now how things we give completely for granted um, in 2002, and we early to and we early noticed when these early projects for archives started to be developed, where we were really not much. Um, integrated in our daily lives. Just think of, you know, how, how Google was still very much in its infancy in, in 2002 as the whole of the web infrastructures. Um, 
So then in 2005, another report that um, is, makes a very good source for writing an early history uh, of, of digital archives, particularly in Europe, is the European Council's recommendations to increase cooperation in archives um, in Europe. So at a European level, which doesn't necessarily mean at a European Union level, um, but there, be, there was already since at least the 90s, the European Board of National Archives. So there was a lot of participation and collaboration and sharing best practice and, and, and project information amongst archives in Europe. And this was sort of like, uh, um, it became a little bit more established in 2006 with the creation of a European archives group. But, but this group of people, this group of heads of, of national archives and um, the main archival institutions throughout Europe were collaborating already for for a few years. And it's interesting to see that in this report that they prepared for the commission in 2005, um, very much said, I really like to put these two, these two um, sentences. Um, the first is that the internet has helped to position archives as irreplaceable professional providers of information about the past and the root of a common identity of communities. Um, and so they recommended um, passing with, with, an, with the national archives of each member state as the main actors to do this, the creation of an internet gateway which will give easier access to cross-border, um, easier access and cross-border access to documents and archives of a member state and of the institutions of the, of, the, of the EU. So I really like the idea that in 2005, they really said how archives were in a way the best institutions to really populate the internet. And then at the same time, the internet could become um, a way of connecting communities by, by sharing not only uh, information that were created at the time, by sharing information um, coming, from, coming from the past. Um, and so, yeah, this is a very interesting, very interesting thoughts behind the, the process of, uh, of creation of, uh, of, European, uh, of European archives. Um, so at, in 2005, when this project came out, um, there were already several, um, several attempts on part of archives to, to go online and several ways in which archives were using um, the web to uh, you know to put their things out there, digitizing the material, but also digitizing the catalog, so making it accessible, accessible um, in a place where well, not just a physical institution, but was also online. Um, so from this report, I compiled a whole list that, of course, I won't um, read completely. But it's interesting to see that it was there were single institution repository. Then there were national aggregators, uh, usually rotating around uh, the proactiveness of the national archives, but not necessarily. So that they could uh, collect uh, um, information about each single archive present on the national territory, and also when available, the archival um, the archival descriptions being digitized. Um, possibly also ingesting the actual archival material. So we have to make and it's very important in Archives Portal, you're on a division between three levels of access. The first level of access is really just to provide the information about an institution, opening hours, address, how to contact them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So creating a big repository, sort of like yellow pages of archives. Um, then there was the level of, of having an actual um, search engine where people could search for keywords rather than for the taxonomies created by books, um, by the archival catalogs over the year, um, but by scheming for keywords, the actual archival descriptions being digitized. And then the third level, which is of course the optimal level, is that of the actual document being digitized and made available online on the web. There will be sort of like three different levels um, of projects where we're starting to be uh, made at a local or national level. But there was also a, already in 2005 international aggregators. And these, in a way, they were the most interesting. And if you notice, um, the countries that were more proactive were like France, the Netherlands, and Spain, um, all countries with a strong colonial past. So in a way, it was a way 
um, to reintegrate archival heritage that had been disseminated um, throughout the war because of the history of this country to sort of like making come together and also in a way a little bit of you know reparation um, to make sure that even though you know the archival material stays in the archives of Paris people from wherever in the world um, could access things that related to their um, local history as a formerly colonized um, country. Or another interesting project where um, some such from, there was a repository made in Poland of Polish history around the world. It was called being po Poland being um, a country with strong migration. It was a way of like um, capturing um, Polish culture and Polish cultural heritage around around the world, where uh, where people will go and migrate and retain their identity identity throughout the years. Um, now I won't get again into too much details in this slide, but you can see that uh, one of the problems was, of course, long term retention of this project. Um, so in total now, uh, what is it, 2005, <laughs> um, 20 years, a little bit less than 20 years down the line, most, uh, most, of, these, uh, most of, it, of these projects are, are, not online, are not online anymore. It's like only around 30% of these are still findable online and, and a smaller quantity are still actually um, being kept engaged. Um, so obviously, the best strategy is to create something that is as big and as international as possible and ideally create um, a single entry point to all of this heritage. And obviously, Europeana will be one of the main projects um, for these. But in 2009, the archives, um, the national archives around EBNA and the EAG and uh, people collaborating and creating these guidelines over the year got together um, to create a project called Archives Portal Europe Network, precisely with, with the idea of creating this gateway for the archival heritage of uh, um, the archival heritage of, of European archives. Um, so the this was the first project that was started as an application to a European Union grant. And it had the objective of creating one single portal where to aggregate all this information that was scattered on national level aggregator or um, single institution level, all in one go, and display the information of the three types, as I said, um, basically the, institute, the, the information of the institutions, the archival catalogs when available, and the link to the digital um, to the digital objects, all searchable through one single engine. And of course, also um, one of the idea was to also uh, this massive aggregator of archives um, also to become the aggregator for Europeana. Europeana is more concerned with digital objects, with a digital cultural heritage at large. Um, and we, as Archives Portal Europe, we offer the service of, uh, of aggregating um, for what concerned the archival material in Europeana. Uh, so Europeana was one of the partners in the project. And I think it went online uh, in 2012 as the first, uh, the first instance of uh, Archives Portal Europe went online in 2012 with 61 institution and 14 million descriptive units uh, available for search. Um, then there was a second project where it was exactly the same, but with more countries involved. And there was also the idea of opening not just to national or institutional archives, um, so you know, local archives, city archives, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but to open also to other types of archives, archives from private foundation, archives from libraries, from museum, um, really anyone willing to participate and share their material. Um, as long as that material had something to do with the history of Europe, which again does not relate to the European Union necessarily, but it's just more of a geographical expression. So, for example, um, one um, one long term partner of this was uh, was uh, was Georgia. Uh, and then finally, in two thousand and fifteen, um, at the end of also this, of the second. Um, a short-term project that was dependent on uh, on our European Union grant, 
uh, there was the decision in order to make it sustainable in the long term, which is very often the, the problem with this uh, with this project. An independent consortium, an independent foundation was uh, was started, which is set in the Netherlands, um, but it really operates in around thirty four countries now. So I put now in in violet the ones that are. Um, proper associate, but we collaborate again with uh, with uh, 30 something countries. And Archives for Tell Europe is now shaped um, as an independent foundation where the assembly of associates, which are the members who contribute by paying a fee and sustaining uh, also financially um, the institution, have uh, um, give a general um, strategy of where of where the project is going and how it should develop. Um, then there is the uh, the board, um, staff members, and country managers network. Um, it's basic. So the, the board and the staff operate on a on a daily basis um, to to maintain and expand the portal. And the country managers network is the network of the, all the representative for each single countries, and we can. And we create projects um, that are meant to engage users, obviously, because all this material and why we want to have uh, um, what we want to have available. But we also um, we also try to get on board new um, institutions so that we expand the capacity of the material. And obviously, there are many technical um, difficulties surrounding ingesting, if not the digital objects, which is great, but even just the catalogs, the archival descriptions um, that are. Um, in a way, also more difficult to um, to digitize, all being ingested in uh, in the portal. This is what we do on a um, day to day day to day basis. Um, so currently, as I said, we are in thirty five countries, twenty four plus languages uh, of the documents, or better, the archival descriptions. Um, we have five alphabets. Uh, that you can search from in, in the portal, 70, more than 7,000 institutions of which more, of a more than a thousand have actually ingested materials. So are actually um, searchable for the, uh, for the portal, which we like to call the Google of archives. Let's explain why in a second. Um, and now the descriptive units, so the collections that are searchable for the portal are now 270 million. And this is obviously still a tiny part of the enormous amount uh, of archival heritage that is represented in, um, in archives, but we are also at a point where it's really, really becoming a very interesting tool for research. And it's where I will suggest to any researcher um, doing archival research, uh, whether for a history project or, or as to really start start with Archives Portal Europe and see where and see where it goes. Um, so just very quickly how, how ingestion works. Um, as I say, we, uh, the, the preferred way which Archives Portal Europe does it is through national aggregators, because that, of course, reduces the amount of types of, of, uh, um, of archival descriptions that are, being, uh, that are being ingested. It makes everything much easier to smooth out and, uh, and integrate, um, et cetera, et cetera. But there are all sorts of things. So a um, national level, a partner that aggregates batches of, of archives. Um, there are also single institutions that are not affiliated um, to any other um, to any other um, to any other national aggregator, but they do have an, a local web presence, and we aggregate and link from that. But there are also institutions that don't have a portal; they don't have anywhere where they put digitally their archival material, but they um, prepare their archival catalogs ad hoc for us. And this is again, in a way, easy because uh, we can have the the the. Um, uh, we can have the archival descriptions prepared so that they're optimal for us. But, uh, um, but at the same time, so obviously, it, uh, you know, it depends on the institution. Uh, it depends on funds. It depends on, 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 on person hours. It depends on many different, uh, many different things. Um, it, is, it, is, it is costly and it is time consuming to do these things. It is absolutely worth it. But obviously, there, also has, there has to be um, the, the awareness um, of the importance of putting archives on the web um, for people to experience archival research in a different way. 
so common technical issues that I really would not want to get too much into because it's not my field of expertise. Um, but if there are questions for that, I will be very, very happy to pass them to my um, technical coordinator for, um, for a more thorough answers. But you know, there are all sorts of problems. There's a problem of using proprietary non-open software when doing the conversion to digital. So we use a specific XML standard. Um, and we have um, instances of archives doing, doing their digital catalogs in, in a way that is not exportable um, with the standards where we use. Um, so absolutely using open, open access software is, is uh, sorry, open, uh, um, open software will be a very important requirement, but sometimes for legacy reasons, sometimes for you know, other reasons, it's not always the case with, with archival institution because obviously, as I said, we're not operating in a vacuum, we are operating on um, projects that may have been already going on for more than 10 years when, when Archisport and Europe started. Um, there are very different hierarchical structures that have to be sort of like matched and combined in order to, um, to render um, something that is searchable, accessible and visible for, for the user, user digitally. Um, the problem of creating machine readable catalogs is of course, as I said, expensive. Um, some catalogs still just have, you know, PDF that are not even OCR um, and that's it. And, and so we have to really recreate um, the catalogs ad hoc. Uh, maintaining and updating the metadata is one of the problems. For example, very often if we have, if we link to the digital object and then that object gets transfer to another platform or somewhere else because of maintenance within uh, the website of an archive, we lose that link. It has to be re-updated. Um, or obviously we, we try to give as many filters and as many search options to our users. But again, these have to be in a machine readable format. This is metadata that needs to be um, updated. And I'll maybe show it in a second uh, when I show the, the, the portal. Um, so filter is, uh, uh, filters and, and maintaining metadata is, 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 is another of the problem that, that we face. And, um, you know, we really try to find the easiest, less time consuming and optimal solutions for, for all of our archives, but there are, you know, a myriad of different, um, of different options. So just to show a little bit, uh, sorry, I will stop sharing now because I need to, um, I need to go on the browser. Great. Um, so I hope clicking the link um, is now showing the um, the Archives of Portal Europe website as it currently is online. Uh, but as you probably can see from my background, we are going through a big restyle um, that will be hopefully a launch um, by the end of this uh, of this year. Um, which, as I will explain later a little bit, it's not just uh, aesthetical, but it has. Um, it includes a lot of new functionalities. Um, but so this is the website, the portal, um, the entry point of, of uh, European archives, as, as you can see it. Um, and there are three ways of doing research. Uh, the first one is the traditional one. You go on the directory where you have the list of all the archives that contribute, um, and you scroll Crawl and you go institution by institution where you can find the list of finding aids and all these holding guides, the archival descriptions, and according to what you're searching for. Um, this is in Finnish, so I want to attempt to, <laughs> to understand. Um, but you will find you will find the, the, the archive from the catalog a little bit like you would in a, in a normal institution. But um, the of course, the, the added value of, of going digital with archives is that you can search for keyword in a Google-like search. Um, so for example, if I put Napoleon, um, I start to get uh, um, results that are from everywhere, um, from many different countries. And this is really the added value of Archives Portal Europe, that it allows to search 
not only for different catalogs at the same time, just with a keyword, instead of, you know, going and having to read and, and start by the subject creator, but you really start with what interests you, um, reduced to a keyword, which creates a new set of problems from a historical point of view, but it's really, really um, a very fundamental, a very important tool for, for high historian. And so you can search in different um, countries, but also in different types of archives. So you could compare, you know, the, the material held in Napoleon or created by Napoleon on, on big archives, like national archives, but you could also go and search, you know, remote parish archives in places that you didn't even know Napoleon had ever been to. So the interesting thing is that you can really, rather than starting with documents that you know exist and are held in some institution and you want to go and check um, and check that, um, you really go for something that you didn't know it existed, possibly somewhere uh, in an institution that also you didn't know existed. Um, and this is really the, 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 the added value. And of course, when there is the digital object available, you can also consult the documents directly. Uh, now, I mentioned that the portal is in 24 plus languages. So um, just very quickly also allow for um, wildcards and Boolean operator. So if you search Napoleon like that, um, making making space for all the possible spelling, and I won't do it now, but you know, you can also add, you know, Napoleon written in Greek or in Georgian or different alphabets, um, and you will get way more results already. And if I added the other alphabets, you'll get even more. So you can really scroll um, with a keyword search through, through many different things. And we also have a decision between um, searching in the archival catalogs, but you can also search in names, which means search with records, the descriptions of the records creators, but also search in the institutions. So for example, it's three different um, repositories where it does the search. Um, search in archives, search into the actual archival descriptions of the documents, search in names, search in the uh, descriptions of the records creators, so the people around which an archival collection was created, and search in institutions, search in the description of the institution. So here with Napoleon, you will find, for example, you know, um, simply addresses, uh, simply archives that are based somewhere which is via Napoleone or Napoleone Road, which is a very, um, something very, very common around uh, Italy and not, uh, not only. Um, but it can be interesting. So for Napoleon, it's not necessarily interesting to search for the institutions, but in other types of research, it can be really interesting. And we are thinking maybe one day, um, it won't be a short-term goal, but one day we may even be able to add a search in documents if we ever get to a point where the digital objects not also have been linked but they are also um but they are also scanned and searchable in a way that is searchable through the text this is of course a little bit sci-fi at the moment but it could be one potential uh, line of research for the future um, and I mentioned that we we search you you should start in archives portal Europe by thinking of a topic um, that you're interested, reduce that to a set of keywords and search for keywords, thinking of what type of words could be in um, in the archival descriptions of it, of, of in the in the text that describes the documents you are interested in. So we also have the possibility of searching through topics, and this is again a lit. This is actually a little bit in its infancy, because um, as of now, the idea of searching for topics is searching for curated collections that refer to specific, um, to specific subjects. And it's up to the archival institution ingesting the material directly, because um, I mentioned before, archives can be ingested, archive, the, the archival material can be ingested in batches by, by an aggregator, but it can also be ingested manually and uh, you know, only by a single institution. And, and they, the people who own, um, has con have control or own, um, is in charge of curating these archival documents and heritage are also the people that have the right to control it, obviously. Um, so every single institution can tag their collection according to a document. But that, of course, means that not, not, all, not everybody does it. Um, maybe for lack of time, it is, again, time-consuming. Or, you know, um, people call 
the same thing in different ways or different thing in the same way. So the topics is, again, something that we really want to work with. And it's going to be one of the um, main, there are two lines of research around the, the way we handle topic. One is through automatic top de topic detection. So we're trying to see a multilingual tool um, that elaborates. So if I search for Napoleon, I will also search automatically for other set of keywords in different languages. Um, for documents that will relate to Napoleon. Um, and we're also trying to improve on, to, to start a crowdsourcing project. This will be a very exciting thing with a new portal when it comes out um, so that people can actually tag with topics, the documents that they search for. And again, this is going to be a suggestion so that the institution say, um, will be ultimately able to decide how to do it. So we have at the moment some that are, quite well placed. So we have, for example, you know, 150,000 documents on the GDR, which is obviously not um, the whole of documents available on the German Democratic Republic, but it's quite, it's quite a good collection to start your search with. And other that are absolutely underrepresented. So like uh, uh, Napoleon only has six records, which basically virtually means no one ever tagged Napoleon. Um, but it's, it's, it's a constant working project progress. And I wonder if it will ever um, be, be finished, probably not. And of course, we will also have to make space for the future um, for another aspect of, of digital archives that historical archives still don't have perhaps assimilated too much um, because it's like, it's starting to get only now to it. But of course, how do you um, prepare and present um, uh, digital born records for the future once they stop being in use and they become historical historical archives. This is again quite new for for historical archives because um, digital technologies used to be super new and exciting, but now actually they start to have uh, a big history. And web technologies and web 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 based um, digital objects, which is again a different type of digital born material. Um, so all this thing, it's one, it's again one of the reasons why Archives Portal Europe was created so that there could be a consortium of people this, this deciding a way forward together rather than go on um, each on their um, separate, uh, separate roads. Um, so I think I can stop sharing now. Um, and Okay, so this was um, uh, an idea of how, sorry, a, a very quick presentation of how um, Archives Portal Europe works. Um, and that we can, oh, oops, okay. Um, so as I said, the, the historical research, um, w w another line of, of research where we are conducting there is how, um, how, these new tools of searching archives in a digital environment can change um, the ways in which we do historical research. So these tools really put forward new ways of uh, um, new ways of doing historical research, particularly for people doing comparative research, because now it's possible to compare same types of documents from many different countries. It was obviously also possible before, but now um, it cuts so much on traveling um, and, and other things that, uh, that it makes possible to do way more, um, way more research there. And also, you know, it, it sort of like can give the initial inspiration on how to conduct research because you can check whether, um, for example, some censuses or some type of documents that exist in one country also exist in the other and do they make an interesting comparison or if you want to compare two countries on whatever subject, you can now, uh, you know, you can now check immediately from, from the archives of that and, you know, it goes on for, uh, it can be du duplicated in, in many other, um, in many other countries. So it really makes it more interesting to, 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 to check, you know, as a European um, 
Council's guidelines said, the common past, but also the divergent routes, the parallelism um, on countries that are geographically uh, in proximity or not. Um, and, um, you know, and the traces that their, their, their history left, uh, um, left in the archives. So transnational aspects of European history is definitely a powerful line of research that gets enhanced in a digital environment. Um, it can allow, you know, as I said, comparing, for example, is, is isolated European communities, the parallelized, the parish archives or university archives can be very helpful in these uh, in these ways. Um, there's also very big, um, very big instances of, of migration. We get a lot of users interested in genealogy and trying to look for information on their relatives scattered in archives from, from all over the world, and this makes it possible to consult them at the same time. Um, so we, Archives Portal a little bit away, it acts as mediator to national and, and, and other portals. Uh, we, we, we cancel out the differences in uh, visiting, you know, the main archives in, in a very big archives or the small parish archives that can maybe only afford to be uh, open for two days a week. Um, because the material digitized is open 24-7 and accessible 24-7 at, um, at any time. Um, another interesting line of research that I suggest always um, to, uh, to, to, to students when, when I present um, in class is um, historical events and characters as narrated by, by very different archives. Um, um, both in different countries, but also in different types of institutions. So how a parish archive will tell about something happening locally or globally or globally um, in, in a way that is very different from how, you know, a city council would, would approach it or um, things like that. And again, it's like being able to compare all the different trades that are left, uh, um, that are left in, uh, in, in history, but also compare the different archival institution and different archival transitions. So for people studying, you know, history of archives of even, you know, a history of knowledge system, this is it's really, really useful to see how differently the material is being organized and also digitized around, um, around you know, around different institutions, different countries. And it also allows a little bit in an easier way for quantitative research, as I said, because the type of data that are, are available um, are... Um, are quite are quite unprecedented. Um, so I mentioned censuses or many other um, quantitative history uh, projects that are running now. Actually, one of the projects that we would like to do more is to dig out what are the quantitative data that are available in these archives through all of the institutions that we have. Um, and not always, unfortunately, the digital object will be available. But another feature of a new uh, of a new Archives Portal Europe that we are about to launch is the possibility if institutions have it as a service to or, um, to order a uh, digitization on demand um, service. And hopefully we will see. We are still discussing that actually, but I'll just say it, even though it's not perhaps completely accurate. Um, it will be possible for researchers who have been into uh, archives and have photographed. Uh, um, and I photographed uh, uh, their material for their research to kindly donate it <laughs> to Archives Portal Euro so that other people can, can see it. Even though it's not the, the nice digitization that an archive will do, it's still good enough for, for, for researchers to, um, to add it. I'm not sure if you've done ever historical research, you, in archives you will have plenty of, uh, of, of, of hard drives full of documents that, that you consulted and, and are just now left there. Um, so just to conclude, uh, to finish a little bit with, uh, uh, with a new website, the new portal, um, well, actually, I should say the new website, because the portal and the repository don't really change, it's always there, it, 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 keeps, being, it keeps being expanded, so um, every day, if you see the, the, the count of the documents increases a little bit, uh, and it's always very nice to see that. Um, so just to finish um, with the um, social machine uh, element, um, we, we really believe in the web as, uh, um, you know, as a social machine, as a way for uh, men and people to communicate amongst themselves. Um, 
And this is also true for, for, for archives. So we, we, we put in touch archivists and researchers in an unprecedented way. We sort of like act as um, middlemen, uh, middle people with, between them. Um, so if uh, uh, so in the new portal, we will have the possibility of, of crowdsourcing projects. Uh, the most important one, suggesting a topic I already, I already mentioned. Um, but you will also be able to link to external data um, even just a Wikipedia page or anything that you think it's interesting. Um, you will be able to link a digital object, again, as I said, uh, in, case it's, uh, in case you have photographs that are good. Again, the institution will decide whether they're good enough to be published or not, um, because we don't want to prevaricate uh, the rights of, of a single institution um, to be in charge, in control of their material and the way it's, and the way it's displayed. Um, people will also be able to provide translations. Um, so we have multilingual tools. We will enhance with just Google Translator the possibility of seeing the archival descriptions translated from one language to the other. We were very strict um, in leaving in leaving the everything in the original language. Not only because of obviously budget problem, it would be impossible to translate everything. And also, in which language do you translate it to? Um, so. Uh, but we would like to give a possibility of people to, you know, visualize something in their language of their choice, even though that was not the original, the original description. Um, and so tra automatic translations will be in place, but of course we all know that we're not, uh, particularly if you translate from not the most popular language ever, um, they're not the most accurate one. So we will allow people, and we have users from everywhere in the world literally to, um, to suggest better translations. Um, and this is also a very important aspect of, uh, of our case portal Europe. Uh, so I think actually I should probably stop talking, which is great because I was at the last slide. So <laughs> that's nice as the last slide. This is pretty much everything I had to say. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Marta, for this fascinating talk. And I can see there are already lots of questions on the YouTube chat. So, um, but I'm just going to jump in ahead and um, ask one question about sort of the overall outlook of this archives portal. So I was wondering when you started your talk, um, you were describing sort of the initial ideas behind it. You went back to 2002, which now seems ages ago. And it very much feels that the idea behind this portal um, was very much in from this era when we're sort of very optimistic about you know archives and what they can do and all of that and and I fully appreciate that and I'm fully behind it. I understand it. I just wonder now that sort of I think there's much more sense of sometimes the uncertainty of the archives, the question about what's in the archives, what do we know about it, what um, what is missing in the archives. How do we deal with this information? So I think, I mean, there are lots of questions around that. So I was just wondering how you think the this archives portal will move forward in terms of is the point, so you mentioned that it's already the largest online repository in the world. Is it sort of about sort of growth is sort of more better or sort of what is sort of the the the, the aim for the for the future? I mean, do you envisage that the the idea is that it simply will keep getting larger or is there a point in, at which you say maybe it's too much now and the focus should be more on sort of like <laughs> deepening rather than <laughs> widening or, and so on. Maybe you could say something about that. No, thank you for this question because it, it is ob obviously a very big uh, open question mark. Um, it's obviously also not up to me to decide. These are just my 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 personal. Um, that would be this would be my personal suggestions. And uh, um, as 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 a as a historian, mostly, so as a user of archives, um, I'm trained as a historian, not as an archivist. Uh, but um, 
I would say that ideally both <laughs> uh, would be would be the optimal. Of course, you always have to struggle with the uh, material reality of, of of having fundings and of being able to continue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but yes, on the one hand, it's it's nice to be able to expand to different types of institution, and we are happy to include in our archives any country and any archive that, that, that knocks on our door and, and wants to become part of, a, um, part of a network by ingesting material. On the other hand, we do have minimal entry requirements for the quality of the, of the archival descriptions. We really work a lot on, uh, um, we work a lot on metadata um, as much as possible. And we also try to work on the quality. So by improving, uh, by adding extra information, um, what is, uh, uh, what is, what is already available on Archives Portal Europe. So we, we, we try to work with, with volunteers, with, uh, with, with interns, hopefully. And of course we have, uh, metadata, sorry, um, a working group on standards, um, that is part of a country managers network. So people representing their own country. And trust me, there's like one different standard for every other country. <laughs> <laughs> the collaborators for Archives Portal Europe, they, 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 you know, they try, they try to come out with, with all these, uh, um, all these problems, and even just have, and of course, then there's the problem, problem of digitizing the actual collection to make it. Um, to make it available. This is not something we are concerned with. This is up to the single institution to decide what to digitize, how to digitize it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But obviously try to push that once they do that, they make a link available on Archives Portal Europe so that it is searchable also from Archives Portal Europe. But when you go on a digital object, you leave Archives Portal Europe to go on the website, whatever that is, could be even just Flickr, um, where the digital object is, is preserved. We are mostly concerned with archival catalogs. So we, we're like, we, we may not give access to the actual document, but it's such a game changer already to be able to access the archival description, know that that archival collection exists in that archive, in a country that you never thought you would even visit. And now you find out that it's relevant for your research. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, I, I see there are lots of questions, so I don't want to take up any more um, time asking my questions. I'll jump straight to, I'm, it's gonna, I'm, I'm just looking through this. I'll start probably with a, a James has a question and he's asking, how does Archives Portal Europe handle changes in descriptions made by the institutions and the aggregators that it aggregates? Or does it only capture descriptive summaries at one moment in time? Uh, so no, we don't. We don't operate any change. We we just move to be on the same um, XML type of, of 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 standard that we use. But we don't we don't operate on the uh, on the actual description. So even in the in, um, enhancing projects. Uh, it will all come as a form of suggestion to that institution and then they decide whether they want to operate the change on their catalogs um, and hence on Archives Portal Europe or, or not. So we, we, we help them to prepare for ingestion um, to create the standards that they should be, but we don't make any, any change. Okay, thanks. Um, and there's another question from Kelvin Beard Jones. He's asking, do you collect data on use of APE and does that usage influence future development priorities? Uh, well, we, we, we do run surveys from time to time. Uh, we monitor how people access the portal. I think that I may be wrong here. I'm not entirely sure 100%, but in the new instance of the portal, one thing we will be able to do is to keep track of how, um, how a user operates on Archives Portal Europe. So which are the keywords that are searched, how they are searched, et cetera, et cetera. We, this will be done anonymously, um, but that will be extremely important for archives um, to understand what is the nomenclature, for example, that is used to, to search something and just try to improve both user experience and potentially enhance the tag catalogs like, like that. Um, but it's at the moment, it's pretty, uh, you know, traditional in our way, just um, user experience. We, we do have uh, tests 
um, with uh, with students, um, so we can tell us what works and what doesn't. Um, I would be probably able to answer much better to this question five years from now when we have launched the new portal and we will have years of experience in the new portal. Because at the moment it's still in its beta, um, in its beta forms. Um, so we are not, uh, you know, we, we I think so far the the main concern was to make. Um, the repository reach a capacity that it was really, really a new tool for, for doing history research. And now we can concentrate it more on user experience. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Marta. Um, another question is from Richard. So he's asking if, um, if you've been actually able to achieve like a single search engine to examine all the member and associated archive catalogs, or is that more of a work in progress at the moment? Well, that's, that's what we're trying to do, but that's obviously, uh, I think, a perennial work in progress because, you know, we, we, we are talking about digitizing thousands of years of, of you know, of archival descriptions um, and ingest them in our Kisport of Europe and make them available there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Richard is also following up uh, or somewhere later in the chat, uh, the question was also, what's kind of your biggest challenge at the moment in terms of what you see as the biggest challenge for the next five years say ahead what, what one thing you would have to point to the biggest challenge i will say yeah just um keep up uh, and possibly increase the speed of uh, of, of ingestion i think the biggest challenge is always um um because it doesn't depend on us in a way. Um, so it's at times can be a little bit frustrating, um, you know, how many archives uh, and archivists are enthusiastic about the project, but they really like the, the skills and with skills are really being the money simply to uh, the money and the, and the manpower to, um, to, 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 uh, to digitize and to prepare the catalogs and to speed up with the, with the ingestion. Um, so this is where we want to push in. We have started uh, grants to help out institutions to, um, you know, to promote digitization, um, not digitization of a collection, but digitization of the, of the archives, uh, of the, sorry, of the archival descriptions. Um, so yeah, this is always usually, um, you know, unfortunately, the the, the biggest challenge that, uh, as I said, this is costly and, and time consuming. It's worth it, but it's obviously a very, very uh, demanding work work in progress, which, which will stay as a work in progress for many, many years to come, probably forever. <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering about that. You said at some point during your talk that uh, you kind of mentioned it very briefly, but you were talking about that, of course, we need also the, the awareness that it's important to actually put things online, which to you and me seems like, well, yes, of course. But I was wondering, is that somehow like work that you're still having to engage in? Do you still have to go and convince people or librarians that would be useful for them to, to invest into this? Uh, do you feel there's still resistance um, in some uh -huh. Personally, no, we don't find resistance, if not in the terms of, you know, um, being realistic with what, uh, with what people can actually do. But everyone is now, um, I don't think there's anyone who still thinks that it's not worth to, if possible, it's not worth to invest uh, um, in, going, in going digital. And it's interesting, you know, how you see, you know, even the smallest parish archives by now and I keep saying parish archives but you know yeah. as, as in you know a very tiny little archive in a little tiny village um that will not be at least at the very very least on on google to be to be found somewhere because um you you really want to serve you know everyone realize the potential of serving a community that is way bigger potentially global rather than just uh, um just the people that your institution was uh, was started for Mm. Absolutely. Um, moving on to a diff slightly different topic, but James is asking how you're planning to deal with the deluge of uh, basically the born digital uh, stuff. How are you going to handle that? So personal and public. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> do you have some um, plan for that worked out? 
there are, I know that there is a lot of discussion and plans are being made, but I uh, was also just told that our um, manager and technical coordinator is also following live on YouTube and she's kind of answering the questions as a comment. Yeah. I will definitely, <laughs> Kirsten, I will definitely bet, um, bet to you. But uh, yes, it, it is going to be a very big problem. I... Um, but uh, on the one hand, you know, we won't have to worry about digitization or, you know, doing OCR as in optical character recognition so that we can search for the text and all that anymore because it, be, it will be done by the default. There will be other uh, horrible problems, uh, I assume, but uh, that one, for example, will be, will be automatically solved. Um, and this is obviously, uh, this is great. So it's going to be... Interesting. I think if we count an historical archives being between 30 and 40 years, um, something becoming a historical document between 30 and 40 years um, from when it was created, we are now about the time to have a digital born the large. So, um, but I don't work in an archival <laughs> institution per se. Um, so I will leave that. Uh, uh, this is something that definitely the ICA um, will be very, very concerned with uh, in, the, in the next, in the foreseeable future. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Absolutely. Um, yes, and uh, sorry, I, I, I noticed that Kirsten is also answering questions there. So I'm, I'm kind of picking some, but I don't always have the complete overview of what's been answered or not. So, um, no, that's okay. I guess <laughs> they will stay. They will stay as comment for later. We can just. Uh, uh, I'm happy to answer to the best of my capacity, <laughs> as long as there are uh, as long as there are questions. Yeah, this um, this moving into this crowdsourcing that seems to be like going to be a big new thing. That sounds really exciting in terms of making which will depend, of course, on people doing that. But as you said, uh, Napoleon hasn't really been tagged at all, <laughs> but we have the GDR and so on, but sort of maybe systematizing that a little so and so to create these kind of collections that you can look into that, of course, would be useful, I imagine, for many researchers. Yes, because uh, it, it's not going to be just um, suggesting topics, but we really want to try to involve the, you know, there's so much enthusiasm around archives, archives scholars really love archives and, uh, you know, whether if it's for work or if it's for their personal interest. Um, we are really happy to try in a way to exploit, uh, in quote, uh, all these uh, uh, all these energy and all these things that are being that are being done. And as I said, um, you know, it's sort of like you, thinking of the web really as a social machine is, is quite important for us as well. So finding always new ways um, of interacting with, uh, with with users and and you know, if, if if a user is willing to to give us some help that is absolutely great because it's always like you know tiny tiny drops uh, you know fill up a bucket in the end so it's uh, we'll see we'll see how it goes we'll see how it goes we will start to experiment it when uh, when the portal the new portal goes live um, but yes we're we're quite excited to see where uh, where it will take us and do you have a sense who's been using the portal mostly sort of and who's been using it for what kind of research or what kind of projects came out of it where the portal was basically integral to the research? Um, so so far our metrics that we analyze are, are very very simple because we don't have a uh, sophisticated cookies or, or or anything like that and we are not also too fond of, of doing it. Um, mm. I can tell you so I cannot really talk about age brackets or preferences or things like that but um, country wise it's really everywhere in in the world whereas like the top 10 is uh, is it, it changes from years to years. Um, it's uh, um, there was a lot of from the US. Um, of course, of course, if you if you're based in the US and you work on, on Europe, that is a very good uh, starting point for your research. Um, at the very worst, you can contact the archivist and ask for the documents because you cannot because of COVID or you don't have the money to travel. Um, like that. But we have we literally have users from the five continents, um, and it's interesting that it's it's both people working um so there are countries that are very well placed they have already a lot of material on the portal and other countries that are um not very well placed but but, but you know they're not because of their there's lack of, of interest or enthusiasm it's really about you know technical issues 
issues with finances and so on. And we have both users from both countries. And um, I noticed that it, there's tend to be um, a lot of cross-country uh, interest. So we, we always have a lot of people from the Netherlands. The Netherlands is super well, for example, um, in, in ingesting their materials. But we're, but we are based in the Netherlands as an institution, as a, as a foundation, and the Netherlands is one of the core countries that, that created all this project. But people from the Netherlands will tend to look at documents from other places. And so we have other countries that are not well represented, but are still have a lot of users um, so it's good to see that users actually do use it uh, not to check the documents from sort of like their country but documents from uh, um, from other countries uh, from other countries as well which doesn't mean you know as an Italian I may do research on some very local aspect of Italian history but I may do it using archives from Finland Norway Iceland um, everywhere else this is really what they think can change for um, for historians in the future, and and I think the users do understand this, and they seem to um, the what we gather from the analytics that we use so far to confirm this. Uh, Fascinating. Um, I'm I'm mindful of the time, um, so I don't want to go over for too long. So I'm just looking if there are any more questions. Uh, I can't see any in the chat, though. I think Kirsten has been really great. She had to leave now, but she's been really great at answering lots of the issues raised. Um, unless there's anything else. Yeah. Um, OK, so unless there's anything else, I think we'll leave it here. And it uh, just remains for great. me to thank you, Marta, Thanks. for this. Um, if I could add just a very, very last note, because it's something sure. I realize I haven't said at all, but it it, it really cons cons um, has to do with, with, the last, with, with your last question, Tessa. Um, it's that we don't only have history researchers. Um, actually, most of the queries that we actually get from users that do contact us relate a lot on genealogy, as, as I mentioned. So um, we we do, of course, cater to, to 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 historians, to researchers, and to archivists. But we users do follow this idea that archives are open to anyone um, interested in, in in heritage. So it's. Uh, it very much leaves the ivory tower of academia. I just wanted to say that um, for um, the sake of completeness. <laughs> yeah, interesting. It seems similar like to newspaper archives where it's always kind of the case that they're often built actually mostly for genealogists by now rather than sort of pure academic researchers and so on because they seem to want to are really using these archives. Right. Yeah. It, it, it really is a universal concern. So yeah. <laughs> that's not a negative. It's actually very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, okay, everyone. Thank you, Marta, for this um, fascinating talk. Um, uh, it leaves me to yeah, wish you all a good evening. And just a final reminder, also, we'll have uh, another digital history talk in, on the 25th of May coming up. So clear your diaries for that one. And it's going to be actually on the history of, of digital history. Uh, so if you're interested, do join us in a month's time or so. Um, yeah, thank you again, everyone, and thank you for all your questions. Thank you for those on YouTube. Um, and yeah, goodbye. Thank you.